Welcome to a series of videos on transformers and self-attention. Recently, transformers have arguably been the hottest of all network architectures, and people are exploring how to make use of it in a range of contexts. Most importantly, it's currently dominating in natural language processing, where it's used for all kinds of tasks, often with amazing results. In this series, we will learn about this architecture and its main properties. In the first video, we focus on the concept of self-attention, but let us start with a high-level description of the transformer architecture to motivate why we want to learn about self-attention. The transformer was originally developed for translation and on a high level, the transformer has a standard encoder-decoder structure, where the input sequence is first encoded into a set of feature vectors and we then use a decoder to produce a new sequence. If we are doing translation, the new sequence would be a sentence in another language. This is pretty standard in machine translation and generally referred to as a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model in the RNN literature. When we use a transformer for translation, we provide a sequence to the encoder. For instance, I have a car. The decoder then takes the output from the encoder along with whatever part of the sentence that we have already translated and computes a probability distribution over the next word. If we assume that the network has already produced the first two words in the translation, tengo un, perhaps the network would predict the next word to be coche with probability 0.6, carro with probability 0.3 and some other word with probability 0.1. We can then use these probabilities to translate one more word. If we select coche as our next word, we can feed the sequence tengo un coche into the decoder and ask it to compute the probabilities of the next word. We repeat this process until our model tells us to output the end of sequence token, here denoted EOS, after which our translation is complete. Even though the encoder-decoder structure described here is standard, the transformer is still novel due to how the encoder and decoder are constructed. In particular, they are based on self-attention, which is the topic of this video. Importantly, even if you don't care about translation, it still makes sense to learn about self-attention. First, because the encoder and the decoder are currently used with great success to solve many other natural language processing tasks. Second, because transformers are currently being explored in various contexts outside natural language processing. In both of these cases, it's actually very common that the networks contain either the encoder or the decoder, but not both. Hopefully this gives you a first idea about what the transformer is. However, to understand the encoder and decoder in more detail, we first need to learn more about self-attention. Self-attention is fundamentally about computing weighted averages. To gain intuition about weighted averages, we can look at a scalar example. Suppose that we have noisy observations x of some function of interest for different values of t and that we would like to produce an estimate yi of the underlying function that we care about for a certain data point ti xi. One possible strategy is to compute the weighted average of the observed x values. In this setting, it seems natural to assign larger weights to nearby points since the function is likely to take similar values at those points. For instance, we might use a bell-shaped curve centered at ti to determine the unnormalized weights w tilde. This would imply that xi gets the largest weight, that the point just to the right of it gets the second largest weight, and that some of the points that are far away get a weight which is almost zero. Before using the weights, we also need to normalize them to sum to one, such that we are actually computing an average. The complete operation performed here is in some sense similar to the softmax operation where we first map our numbers to non-negative real numbers, w tilde, and then normalize their sum to 1. For the particular point that we have looked at so far, 
we obtain the value of y indicated here. A technical detail here is that capital W has two indices, j and i, where the second index, i, specifies the data point for which we are computing a weighted average. In the bottom figure, i is therefore fixed for all the green stars. We can now go through all the data points and do the same thing. Since the bell shape that determines the weights is always centered around the data point that we are looking at, we now obtain different weights and thereby different values for y. The resulting estimates are definitely smoother and they probably don't look entirely unreasonable. The next question is how we can make use of weighted averages in the context of languages and words. Consider the following sentence. Emma hates games, but she's a great friend. If we want to compute weighted averages for the words in this sentence, how can we do that? Well, as a first step, we can replace words with vectors of real numbers, which might be 256, 512, or 1024 elements long. So these vectors are fairly long. Given the word vectors x1 to x9, we can now compute weighted averages. For instance, if we want to compute a new word embedding for the word friend in this sentence, we could produce weights w1 to w9 and then compute the average w1 times x1 plus w2 times x2 and so on up until w9 times x9. Note that the weights w1 to w9 are specific for the word friend and that we want to use other weights to compute word embeddings for the other words. To be precise, we could use a second index to specify that these are the weights for the word number 9. In fact, that's what we did in the scalar example, but I'm skipping that index here to keep the notation simple. The next problem is to choose the weights, and this is far from obvious. In the 1D smoothing problem that we looked at previously, we used a Gaussian kernel to give nearby data points larger weights. But it seems to make less sense to do that here, since it might yield large weights for words like is and a. Uh. One could imagine that we would like the new word embedding to convey information about who the word friend is referring to. In that case, it would make sense to give she and Emma larger weights. Perhaps some weight on great would also be useful to acknowledge what type of friend she is. The idea is anyway that if we could give words like friend, she and Emma large weights, perhaps we could obtain a new vector that carries additional information about friend, which is specific for this particular sentence. That is, whereas the original word embedding for friend, x9, is generic and designed to make sense in any context where that word might appear. The new vector y9 that we compute is adapted to the context of this sentence where the friend is a female person named Emma. Still, we are obviously not planning to select the weights by hand, and we need some type of mechanism for doing so automatically. A first possibility could be to obtain a series of z values by simply computing the inner product between x9 and the other word embeddings. If the original word embeddings for the words she and friend are sufficiently similar this would give an inner product which is large and thereby a large z value for the word she. Note that z can also take negative values, which is why I've abandoned the w tilde notation from the previous slide. And we pass the z values through a softmax operation in order to obtain weights that sum to 1. This strategy for computing weights has been used in some contexts but it's far from obvious that it would give reasonable weights. Perhaps we shouldn't just give large weights to words with similar word embeddings. A related problem is that there are no free parameters that can be adjusted in order to obtain better weights. Instead of directly taking the inner product between the original word embeddings, the self-attention layers in a transformer instead introduce two matrices, WQ and WK that are used to transform the vectors before computing the inner products.
In our example, this would give a query vector Q9 for the word friend and key vectors K1 to K9 for every word in the sentence. We then take the inner product between the query vector Q9 and the key vector K1 to obtain Z1. The inner product between Q9 and K2 to obtain Z2 and so on. Finally, we pass the Z values through a softmax to obtain the weights used to compute a new word embedding for the word friend. So what do we gain by doing this? Well, it certainly looks more flexible and the matrices WQ and WK both contain free parameters that we can train. When reasoning about these expressions, a simple example to consider is that both WQ and WK are square matrices such that if the original X vectors are 512 elements long, so are the key and query vectors. At the same time, it arguably becomes even more complicated to know what's going on. Previously, we could argue that words that are similar in some sense might have similar word embeddings and that this would give large inner products and thus large weights. But this is probably not true after applying these transformations. In an attempt to gain some intuition, let us reason about if we can select the matrices WQ and WK to yield large weights for the words Emma and she in our example. Since these were the first and the fifth words in our sentence, this means that we want large values for Z1 and Z5. Now, the input to our self-attention layer is a set of vectors, also known as word embeddings, and people have seen that words that are related tend to cluster. For instance, words like hockey, game and play tend to appear close together. And the same is true for words like Mars, space and Venus. Most likely the words Emma, girl, she and woman would also appear in the same region. Note that this visualization is only two dimensional, but that the word embeddings that we are comparing are actually long vectors. One way to obtain large weights for both Emma and she would therefore be to select WK to be the identity matrix, such that the key vectors are identical to the original vectors. In that case, the keys for Emma and she would still be close together. To make Z1 and Z5 large, we can then select WQ to be some matrix that maps the word embedding for the word friend to a query vector Q9 as illustrated in the figure. Naturally, since Q9 is now essentially pointing in the same direction as the word embeddings X1 and X5, this would give a large inner product and thus large values for Z1 and Z5. The intended conclusion is that it appears that the new matrices that we have introduced seem to be able to obtain large values for the words Emma and she. Let's now go back to our example and describe the mechanics of self-attention. To wrap up what we've said so far, we have discussed how to compute a new word embedding for the word friend by taking a weighted average. The first we will do is to compute a query vector Q9 by multiplying the matrix WQ with X9. We then compute the key vectors for all the words in our sentence and then obtain weights by taking the inner products between the query vector Q9 and the key vectors for all the words in our sentence. We then use softmax to obtain non-negative weights that sum to one. And finally, we obtain the new word embedding Y9 by taking the weighted average W1 times X1 plus W2 times X2 and so on. Hopefully, this gives us a new word embedding for the word friend that contains additional information about the current sentence. Of course, we want to do this for all words in the sentence. For instance, to compute the new word embedding for the word games, we use the word embedding X3 to compute the query vector Q3. The query vector is therefore different in the new calculations whereas the key vectors are actually the same. Note that we also use the same weight matrices 
WQ and WK. We then compute Z values by taking the end product between the query vector Q3 and the different key vectors K1 to K9. As before, we compute the weights using a softmax. This will give rise to weights that are different to the weights we computed for the word friend. And perhaps the words Emma, hates, games and she will now receive large weights. Since the weights are not the same, we also obtain a different word embedding when we finally compute the weighted average. Now, as you can see, I've been a bit sloppy and reused the notations Z1 to Z9 as well as W1 to W9 for all words. In the next video, we introduce a proper notation and two final tricks that the actual self-attention layers use to get even better performance.